afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the second talk of the semester organized by the Mongolia Initiative. I'm very happy to have uh, uh, to introduce Devon Deer, uh, to welcome her to give a talk today. Um, just a few words about Devon. She finished her PhD at Harvard in 2014 and then worked in, as an assistant professor at Kansas University. And she's currently an independent scholar and she focuses on economic history uh, of Mongolia. Uh, before I let her speak, I have two short announcements about uh, two additional events that we are running. Uh, well, the related to Mongolia. Uh, the first one is the pop-up exhibit by the UC Berkeley map librarian um, Susan Powell at 50 Macon Hall on Friday 10th at 11 a.m., where she will be talking about the evolution of 20th century Mongolia-China border in maps. And the second um, event I would like to draw attention to is running on Monday, April 3rd. And it's on Mongolian archaeology. It's a whole day of um, fascinating talks. Um, and it will be taking place here. So it's Monday, April 3rd at between 10 and 6 p.m. Uh, now I, I give the mic to, uh, to Devon. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Very happy to see a Mongolia initiative doing so well. Um, so I'll begin this talk today with a, an anecdote of a local minor case that took place in 1905 in the city of Kyakta. I'll use the more familiar Russian name um, for the city. This is Kyakta here. Kyakta was a trading town perched on the northern edge of what was then Qing administered Mongolia. And at the turn of the century, uh, 20th century, Kyakta was still bustling, if not at its famed height from the 18th century. Separated from a bridge, uh, but quite permeable in practice, as you can see here, was the small town of Mai Mai Chung on the Qing side of the border. So in the early 18th century, overland trade between the Russian and Qing empires was legalized through the port of Kyakta. A Qing Anban, an imperial resident, Stationed there in the 1780s, wrote of the city that stores are gathered together like clouds, the markets are loud and bustling, and the town has prospered greatly from the trade north of the Gobi. Kyakta was a node in a large trade network that spanned what is today southern Siberia, northern Mongolia, and northeastern Inner Mongolia. However, as trade was opened, closed, and uh, reopened over time, the image of Kyakta as an orderly, bustling trade town transformed into a messy site that supported legal and extra legal trade one of Kyakta's streets. Uh, by the last decades of the 19th century, Kyakta's residents complained about the city's poor sanitation and the lack of funds for improvements, about Chinese merchants and workers taking up permanent residence and growing small gardens, and the volume of people sneaking goods across the border during the night. So the anecdote I'll tell begins with a list of stolen goods. And the list reads as such. Inside the sack was one old Mongolian book, one letter sent by telegraph, a notebook written in Russian, two belts bound in silver, a silver knife, a cloth belt, one monk's habit, one fur hat, one piece of lemon-colored clothing, and three of light yellow, one wrapping cloth, and one biography of Chinggis Khan. Ordinary, commonplace things. <laughs> so these ordinary, commonplace things were stolen goods reported by a Russian subject, Buryat Mongolian man, who's known in the documents by the Russianized version of his name, Cherenpov. He'd come to the Qing to trade in 1905. As it was too onerous to carry all of his goods with him at once, he'd arranged to leave some of his wares with a local Qing Mongolian official whose name is recorded as Jamsaran. Let's say my documents are in Manchu, so sometimes these Mongolian names are a little odd in the recordings. He'd met Jamsaran while in a Chinese shop in Mai Mai Chung on the Qing side. And while at the shop, uh, the Buryat trader agreed to store his goods and camels with Jamsaran. He left him with two sheets, quote, afaha, of paper money as an initial deposit. In the write-up of this case, from which this account is taken, the actual type of paper money is never specified. The sheets of paper money, though, were most likely Russian rubles. So following the Treaty of Beijing in 1860, a treaty that granted Russian subjects the right to trade in parts of Qing territory, paper money, most often Russian rubles, increasingly appears throughout northern Mongolia. But paper money interacts with a variety of other commodity monies, ranging from the most well-known, which was brick tea, which was tightly pressed bricks of low-grade tea, to coarse cotton fabric, cotton, and animal pelts. And as was typical in these types of transactions, the amount of money was not recorded as rubles, but simply as another type of money. So here, the sheet type of money, 
as compared to bricks of money or horse and camel type money or the other monies I'll talk about. Uh, nowhere do we see another designation than sheet. So the Buryat Mongolian trader then went on alone to conduct other business. And when he returned, Jamsaran and his goods laden camel had entirely disappeared. So the trader calculated the value of his stolen goods at, quote, 52 sheets of paper money. And in combination with the two sheets of paper that Jamsaran had already taken from him, his debt had reached 54 sheets. And in order to gain repayment, he brought the matter to the Russian consul at Kyakta, who subsequently notified the Qing official in neighboring Maimaicheng. Like most cases, the result was left unrecorded, so whether he ever received his money back and his ordinary commonplace stolen goods, we'll never know. But this missing pouch provides a window into some of the ordinary commonplace things carried by small-scale traders across the border. But it's also noteworthy, particularly for what I'll be discussing today, for not only what he carried, but for how he demanded his repayment, which was in sheets of money. So the case described is not atypical in Qing and regional Siberian archives. This project was initially undertaken as my PhD thesis, so uh, some of this region research began about eight years ago. And it was explicitly a Qing history project. And as such, I looked to the intersection of these kind of marginal lives, these Russian, Chinese, and Mongolian people, known in Chinese as, quote, those who made a living on little capital, as they interacted with the Qing, and to an extent, the Russian imperial bureaucracies. The Qing bureaucracy here refers to a very specific set of administrative offices, namely the Yamens and Ulaanbaatar, then known as Hure, Uliastai, and Hoft, the customs post in Kyakta, and sub-prefectures in Inner Mongolia. And the transactions I look at come from an archive. So they have, like all sources, limits and possibilities. They're snapshots. They're opportunities to peer into this small space in people's bags. They're many things, but I'll also tell you up front what they're not. They're not transactions between friends and family members, usually. Uh, so today I'll speak about money, but maybe only fleetingly about value. We can talk about this more in the questions. Um, I also say they're not all transactions where something went wrong. Often they were bundled up in a case where something had gone wrong, something had been stolen, but you had a litany of every economic transaction this person had ever conducted, seemingly. Or their tax reports, even the most interesting of all. So like Russian economists who surveyed Mongolia in the early 20th century, I was initially, I admit, annoyed by the proliferation of commodity monies. As I struggled to make price indexes and generate data sets rigorous on which to run economic regressions, I laugh at this now because it would have been so impossible, I grew increasingly frustrated with the paper money that I saw. Because theories of money ranging from Marx to modern economists tell us that a major function of fiat currency is to standardize or to bring previously incomparable objects into relation or into a common regime of value. I realized I kept waiting for paper money to do a specific kind of work, meaning to act as an agent of commensuration. Even though sociologists and anthropologists have disproven the supposed perfect fungibility of modern money, or in more poetic terms, its colorlessness, I was expecting fiat currency, in which I include both Qing and Russian paper notes and coins, to act in a certain way and to perhaps compete with or to displace prior currencies in circulation. But I realize that the history of trade, and specifically the history of debt, is necessary to make sense of the entry of paper money into Mongolia in the late 19th century. If there is a major narrative of Mongolian economic history in the Qing, it is of the exploitation of Mongols by Chinese merchants, specifically a type of organization known as traveling Mongolian firms or traveling Mongolian merchants. Uh, they developed their own guilds and organizations in Shanxi province in the cities of Hohat and Baotou in southern Mongolia. And this trade produced an entire commercial infrastructure in Qing Mongolian regions that grew to take on the task of acquiring Mongolian raw materials. These firms relied on debt to do their work. By the late 19th century, a large segment, calculating any specifics here is for several reasons most likely impossible, of the adult Mongolian population was in some degree of debt to Chinese firms. The extent of this debt was made possible because debt was not always taken on individually. It could be acquired by a head of a banner and then distributed. And debt also could be inherited across generations. These cases last routinely for several decades, not longer. In the 19th century itself, debt was so ingrained in Mongolian economic life that debt and trade had become equated in the institutional language of the Qing government in Mongolia. So when Chinese merchants informed the Yamen, that is the Qing office in Hure, that they would be entering Mongolian banners, the standard Manchu language phrasing merges debt and trade. So it's literally coming to collect trading debts or to trade and collect debts, depending how you translate it. So this longer history of money is necessary to explain the work that paper money does and does not do. In this paper, I'll sketch what I call Qing demonetization namely the discouragement, the prohibition of using copper coins, 
along with how these Chinese firms made their profits, and how this demonetization led to what I will call hypermonetization in the 19th century, in which a wide range of commodities could become designated as money. And this is perhaps the most unexpected part of money in Qing Mongolia. Being a region that was chronically short of specie or paper money, which was in part state enforced, yet still obligated to pay its dues to merchants or to the state, meant that Mongolians needed to transform a range of commodities into money simply in order to survive. And also the materiality of money helps illuminate how debt functions. So many objects a person owned could be turned into money. Horses, sheep, camels can all enter this money phase. That's all I'll talk about. To pay their creditors, people gave up a range of their belongings, including at times paper money and copper coins. But the unclear boundaries of money in Mongolia, a single object's dual role as an ingestible commodity and capable of fending off starvation and of a unit of account, opened up opportunities to push back against creditors' demands. So I'll explore how complicated ideas are about standardization and whom standardization benefits really are. In short, I guess this paper is one part of a broader project of historicizing, thinking about money as an agent of social change. So early Qing money, demonetization. Some basic ideas of what Qing money looked like in ingot form, <coughs> coin form. Um, there are many examples of money and precious metals in Mongolian territories before the delineation of the Qing and Russian border in the 17th century. We know that Buryat well, Mongolian elites controlled mines and had metalworking factories, and other dour Mongolian princes were said to have silver ingots from their trade with China. It's an ingot. Uh, prior to the Treaty of Nerchinsk in 1689, Mongolian aristocrats, as David Sneath has termed them, were political leaders who maintained geographically delineated polities and economic relations with those around them. Before their incorporation into the Qing and Russian empires, Halk and Buryat Mongolians had managed trade relations not only with their own tribute payers, but with merchants as far away as Bukhara in Central Asia. So those who became Qing subjects were transformed into outer vessels, the tribute payers under Qing sovereignty. So delineating the border ended tribute as a shared political and economic system across Inner Asia. In the political space of the Qing Empire, tribute payments marked Mongolians as uneasy outsiders, but also provided the rationale for their semi-autonomous status. The potential privileges between being an outsider, the ability to maintain a semblance of local control over affairs, came up against the changed economic reality facilitated by both the perceived necessities of war and Qing officials focused on animals as a basis of subsistence pastoralism. So during the early Qing, there's no definitive statement about what Qing emperors deemed to be an appropriate Mongolian way of life. But when Qing officials in Manchu em and uh, Manchu emperors described Mongolian livelihood, a set term, it had a very clear connection to how they saw subsistence pastoralism. Wealth was found in the store of animals rather than their capacity as exchangeable commodities. Um, both wealthy Buryat Mongolian traders who stored silver and gold, as well as small shoestring traders, whom I'll talk about in a moment, are really absent from any Qing discussions about the economic health of Mongolia. So take for an example an edict from the Jiaqing Emperor in 1803 that, quote, because Mongolian territories have for a long time contained Chinese who rent and plant land, it necessarily leads to hindrances to nomads. Okay. Statements appear so f like this appear so frequently and across so many contexts, they, be con they can be considered a kind of, as Ann Stoller has termed it, colonial common sense. This perception of animals' relationship to wealth and stability makes sense within the Qing's very specific understanding of what constituted pastoralism. When pastoralism was equated to a livelihood in which animals provided, or should provide, a bulk of subsistence, animals are meaningful in and of themselves and suitable for immediate consumption or use but they're generally not transformed into other commodities entirely, such as wool or leather, that are going to be sold at markets. So Mongolian territories were deemed healthy if they possessed sufficient livestock. And competition over animals and their land then marked the extent of Qing concern. When the Yongzheng emperor worried about the negative effects of stationing troops in northern Mongolia, he noted that it would, quote, unavoidably be harmful to Hulk Mongolian's way of life, since both troops and pastoralists would be competing for the same resources. So in short, Qing officials' conceptions of nomadic livelihood ignored, uh, in practice, ignored the secondary commodity functions of animals as products. In addition to blocking large-scale traders in wool or livestock, the Qing state's focus on pastoralism also meant that the poorest members of society, or those otherwise separated from home and kinship networks, were seen as aberrations. In the 17th century, uh, 
17th century provides us with examples of men without access to livestock who would then turn to earning Chinese copper coins just to get by. So I'll give a brief example of one case from the early 18th century of a man named Bayar. Bayar was caught as an illegal border crosser between the Qing and Russian empires, pretty short, uh, soon after the border had been delineated. And Bayar claimed that when he was 33 years old, which was 26 years prior to this deposition, he'd been herding animals in a territory that was at the time neither Russian nor Qing. And when herding, he was kidnapped by a Russian man. This man took him over the border, but somehow on the Russian side of the border, Bayar became gainfully employed and in the winter purchased from a Russian headman a woman whom he married and her two sons, one of whom was nine and the other was six. For these three souls, he paid 250 copper cash. Later on, he was then able to purchase a Hulk Mongolian woman from another Russian. So this, this trade in humans is very poorly understood, but obviously happening. And he purchases her for three horses and three heads of cattle, and then also purchases a wife eventually for his adopted son. They give birth to two more people. But this gives a glimpse of cash transactions before the border was firmly established. And the networks of Chinese merchants, originally military purveyors for Qing armies in the 17th century, continued to grow throughout the 18th. And briefly stated, their profits grew in large part because of the merchants' manipulation of interest rates between the daily use products they provided and the repayments provided by Mongolian purchasers. So with copper coins, the preferred currency for daily purchases, silver ingots were stores of wealth or units of account, they weren't really used in transactions. Um, with these coins discouraged, Chinese merchants worked in a market of profound informational asymmetry, calculating their own principal and interest in terms of coinage, but demanding payment in terms of commodities. Merchants were able to manipulate the interest rates to such an extent that the animals repaid were never enough to match the interest which compounded monthly, let alone the principal. So drawing the border then changed the right, changed who had the right to extract and trade materials, the leather, pelts, and wool that were so important to inner Asian economies. Um, when the Qing court licensed Chinese firms to work in Mongolian regions, it ended the control, essentially, that Mongolian elites had had over the extraction of these commodities and obtained through their own tributary relationships with other Mongolian-speaking and other inner Asian groups. So as many have argued, credit forms a link between the presence. The Mongolian case here may be a little different from the ideal type. The creditor is not denying himself anything in the present for gains in the future, as is often assumed. The state of debt produced rather normal income for the creditor, the Chinese or the Russian merchant, while the repayment or the liberation from the debt was pushed further and further into the future and until the late 19th century never reached. So again, to underscore the debt that sustained Chinese trading enterprises in Mongolia was underpinned by early Qing, the early Qing state's view of what constituted a healthy Mongolian economy. These two factors, a state that saw a healthy Mongolian as one free of hindrances in pasture lands, and Chinese merchants who profited from debts to be repaid in kind rather than currency, laid the groundwork for what I will call the hyper-monetization of the 19th century. So by the mid-19th century, Chinese merchants lived and worked across northern Mongolia. In the mid-1850s, one Russian observer, uh, Korsak, reported that more, se more senior Chinese traders in Mai Mai Chung uh, fewer Chinese traders in Mai Mai Chung were living year round. Rather, they'd stay between three and four months, and after that, they would return to regions further south. And then in the winter, they would come back with goods. When they arrived in November and December, they brought wagons filled with fruits, rice, sugar, dishes, brick tea, silk, and other fabrics. In Hure in the 1860s, shops had been confined to the west side of the city, but they'd steadily expanded so that by the 1890s, the commercial district took up almost the entire area between the city center and Gandan Monastery. And while wealthier Chinese merchants could afford to move between Mongolian trade towns and their homes in the interior, poorer clerks were the ones who lived year round. And this image shows a bit of that. The clerk obviously in much kind of poorer clothing than the merchant he's serving. So the transactions undertaken by these merchants happened with multiple forms of money at play, all of which were referred to in Manchu as money. So surveying 1,119 routine Manchu language documents from the National Archive of Mongolia, there are no less than 14 kinds of money the latter half of the 19th century. And some of the major ones, the most common ones are listed on this chart. So it's a whole range from maybe what it was being used for, like salary money is common in budgets, to the form that it took. Um, when these documents are translated into Chinese, this 
kind of nuance or the sense of what money meant is lost. So I'll give you an example here. The Chinese documents make it look much closer to barter, where you have some amount of commodity, it's worth in this specific transaction, this amount of money calculated in tails, sometimes in copper cash, and that's it. But the Manchu understanding, Manchu language understanding seems to be a bit different. So tea, livestock, and other commodities all circulate through this category of money. Again, they're referred to as money, they're not calculated in terms of money, as in copper coins. So for example, in, in one 1904 case, an indebted duke in the Tushethan Aimag um, reported that he'd obtained horses, cows, and sheep, and he was going to bring them as money to clear his debt. So declaring objects money allowed for the simultaneous use of several commodities or commodity monies in a single transaction. And during the latter half of the 19th century, you see foreign observers frequently remark on the most common commodity, which is brick tea. So for example, in his 1870s visit to Hurei, recorded in his book, Among the Mongols, the Scottish missionary James Gilmore describes the city streets as follows. Quote, the streets are mostly busy with Chinese going hither and thither and Mongols bent on shopping expeditions. It is said that recently Chinese brass cash, brass cash has been introduced as the circulating medium for retail trade but till within a few years ago, buyers in the market used to be conspicuous from their clumsy bricks of tea, which they carried in their arms or lashed to their saddles. This is a fairly typical observation. You see. So these clumsy bricks of tea are rectangular pressed sheets of tea. They'll look somewhat like bricks. The most common were fat and thin bricks, which had relatively standardized units. And interest was often calculated in terms of these bricks by firms, such as fine brick tea was the usual measure for interest rates. In Manchu language documents, brick tea is often referred to as tea used as money, by Talat or Menguntai. So foreigners wrote invariably about brick tea, but many more kinds of money are being used in everyday transactions. So I'll talk about a few cases from Alexander Nemchinov, who is a Kyakta, third guild Kyakta merchant. This is one of his credit tickets that he received to get permission in 1861 to trade in the Qing Empire. Um, he was a fairly successful merchant locally, was known for his large fleet of river barges. And like other Siberian merchants, he conducted his business in Mongolia through multiple forms of money and capital. His own accounts are held in the archive of Ulanade in Buryatia, and they show an image of him concerned with transporting silver and occasionally with the actions of his seemingly ne'er-do-well son who would get up to no good in Kyakta's back alleys. But the neat silver movements of his account ledger contrast with these complex transactions where, quote, paper tickets of cash money are leveraged against fabric and real estate and bags of flour. And these are the cases that appear about Nemchinov and Qing archives. So these were much more interesting. So at times, Nemchinov was a reseller of brick tea back into the Mongolian market. So he was purchasing it from Chinese merchants and then reselling it back to Mongolians. In one 1866 case, his shop head, who's a Buryat man, these Russian merchants all relied on Mongolian language expertise to run their businesses. Um, this Buryat man had sold 100 boxes of brick tea on credit to a member of the ecclesiastical estate, the estate of the Jebsen Dambahutukt, a man whose name was recorded as Baling. Because Baling was unable to repay the debt, Midar came up with another plan. He asked, uh, the shop head came up with another plan. He asked Baling to put up a 14-room building that he had access to on a 40-year mortgage. So though Baling was apparently cash poor, he could access real estate due to his political connections. And as with other rental agreements between Russian merchants and Mongolians, there was a letter of guarantee, it's called a Manchu Octolotopite, and after 40 years had passed, seemingly the terms of the mortgage had paid the debt. I want to point out this repayment took place over 40 years which was a sizable portion of Alexander Nemchinov's adult life. And this duration was not atypical for him or other merchants. In another of Nemchinov's cases, he, bought, he brought coarse fabric to trade for copper coins and wagons to rent, meaning it was a Mongolian trader providing the cash to one of Nemchinov's representatives. In another, a Mongol who lives in Kyakta, whose name's recorded as Gombu, had arranged to buy white flour for, quote, 272 paper tickets of cash money or coin money, depending how you translate this. The term for paper ticket here implies more of an IOU than a ruble, and this ambiguity is very common. 
So asking where this money came from is complicated, and the movement of monies often seems circular. And there's evidence that Buryat traders are importing rubles into Mongolia. This is the kind of quantitative information you can get that's obviously incomplete, um, but we do see Buryat parties pretty routinely importing rubles as a commodity into Qing Mongolia with a seemingly very large spike this one year. The debts owed to Chinese merchants at times required poorer Mongolians to search for access to specie. So banners that were indebted but low on livestock had several options open to them, including working at Qing border posts and borrowing money from other banners. So one Jasak under the jurisdiction of the Tetan Han Aimag had experienced a shortage of livestock in his region for several years. To make up for these debts, many men in his banner turned to relay stations, postal relay stations, and other border posts, um, Karun, to earn their wages. The men who did this were poor and had seemingly absolutely no livestock. But through this work at relay stations, they could earn a hun uh, thousand tails, presumably annually, though this is a really large sum, from a salary. And in order to obtain these positions, they would swap out temporarily with members of their own family. So money in the form of tails, which was most likely transformed into tea by the time they received it, was something that could be earned if one lacked other capital. So in one case, uh, another case, a member of the Tushat Han Aimag was in a very large debt. He'd taken it on in 1830 and distributed the debt throughout his banner. Because the debt was large, it became distributed even more widely than his own banner. It actually became distributed to neighboring banners. But the problem came when three of these banners experienced a famine and became, quote, poor of property, making it so their subjects could not produce the livestock they would need to repay the interest on the debt. What followed was a complicated transfer of resources to remedy the debt, demonstrating long-distance trade networks available to some Mongolians. One banner called on relatives in Hoved in Western Mongolia to soldiers in postal relay stations in Altai, um, near Uliasai, Lamas and Dolan Nors temples in Inner Mongolia. This is a, a single banner calling on these connections. And the other banners of the Tushet Han Aimag to put up capital to help with the debts. So quote, because the banners could not cross over the interest on which they fell behind, and quote, in 1833 um, reported to the Yemen that they were not able to raise any more sheep and they essentially had nothing to do even with these cash transfers. So the small amount of cash served to mitigate the lack of sheep and other livestock but by the time this case made it to Hure, to the kind of high-level Manchu Amban, the debt remained, and this was the year 1875. So this had continued to multiply, and these cash transfers had been attempted to be obtained for 55 years. So these kinds of seasonal wage labor jobs, perhaps at custom stations, perhaps at border posts, could provide the poorest Mongolians with access to specie and brick tea. For Mongolians who worked for Russian firms, we know that payments for a day labor uh, took the form of tea and occasionally took the form of kind, so you would get to keep some of the wool that you'd cleaned. Wages in the last Thai region, for example, reached a fat tea, estimated at 60 kopecks for a man, and a thin tea, estimated at 40 to 42 kopecks for a woman, with slightly higher wages in the autumn. And in the first years of the 20th century, it was common for debts taken from Russian merchants to be calculated in what in Manchu were called, quote, Russian credit tickets. But the unit of account and the form of repayment often diverged. So in these documents, I found no firm indication that certain kinds of money were categorically preferred for certain transactions. And transactions are rarely conducted with a single currency or a single category of commodity money at a time. Even in the early 20th century, as Mongolian borrowers took from Russian creditors with defined terms of interest, for example, 3% over 24 months, which was a huge improvement over Chinese terms where interest could reach um, 7 to 10%. The details of negotiations of the return of, quote, Russian paper money often moved into livestock. So I'll turn a bit um, to a budget that I found. I was fortunate to find some local Yaman budgets of the Yaman and Hure for the years 1903 to 1904. For each month of this budget, an administrator noted that, quote, the money was insufficient. Each month began with this refrain, our money is insufficient. And the budget begins by giving equivalences between tea and tail silver. And these equivalences were necessary for Qing government workers, the Qing officials in Kyakta, because although their salaries were calculated in tail silver in Beijing, they would end up receiving only boxes of tea from the state. 
So, quote, in the old regulations, their budget stated, each tail was specified to be five bricks of thin tea, which is calculated to be one fat brick. The budget then lists each employee of the Yaman's ration and tea, ranging from 165 bricks per month for the highest level employee, down to 24 bricks for low-level clerks. Their expenditures in the office are also recorded down to the brick of tea, which was then reconverted in their accounts to copper coins. And you can actually see them doing these translations in the margins of the budget. So for example, their tea for drinking, which was separate from their tea for trading, and candles for which they lit their office were two tails or 10 thin bricks of tea. So this lack of funds drives many in Mongolian offices themselves, so in the Qing bureaucracy, to turn to loans from Chinese high interest lenders. The governor general in Uyastai, for example, sent an impassioned plea to the Yaman and Hure describing the dire state of affairs in his garrison, writing that, quote, the local situation is absolutely poverty stricken. And he even says that the only ingots he has access to to repay his debts were not smelted from silver, but were salt. What he actually calls salt ingots, which were salt taken from the salt lakes in Western Mongolia. That term really threw me for a loop when I saw it. Hmm? Still an important commodity, but it was a sign of desperation when one had to trade in salt. So large payments also ended up posing problems for government offices. For example, reparations payments made to Russia as part of the Boxer Rebellion's indemnity were actually generated from selling cat fur in the Yamen. This was presumably a very valuable fur of a very large cat, probably a leopard, for 800 tails and nine copper cash. 7,000 tails of the reparations were then further divided between the Tushet and Tessin Han Imegs, but their portions were to be paid in livestock. This is a national reparation, or you know, empire-wide reparations payment. So the Manchu administered bureaucracy in Qing Mongolia was not immune from the complexity and the shortage of currency. However, increased foreign competition and higher taxation in the latter half of the 19th century along with new officials sent from the interior who were less familiar with the workings of Mongolian money, caused an increase in debt recalling cases. One exemplary case took place in the spring of 1897, when one Chinese merchant called in a significant debt from a Mongolian. Um, his name's recorded in Chinese as Udoka. Since this Chinese firm was on the verge of going out of business, which is pretty common by the 1890s, they had requested that the Mongolian debtor repay his debt in full. But the debt had reached an enormous sum of several hundred thousands of tails, which made any immediate repayment impossible. This is an unreal sum of money. The Manchu Amban at the time was dissatisfied with this response and ordered that the Mongolian repay 10,000 tails each year towards the original debt, again, a huge amount of money. This is just a Chinese shop. The Amban, newly imported to Mongolia, however, had interest in keeping Chinese credit flowing and the Chinese merchants in business. So he reported his response to this case was, quote, although it's said to empathize with Mongolian circumstances, we've not empathized with the merchant's circumstances. As for these merchants who abandon their parents and desert their wives to run several thousand li to the desert, they are those who defy extreme cold for profit. Now, not only do you get rid of their profit, but you also want to sell their principal at the lower rate. So you can see these newcomers don't have much of a sense that this principle may have been acquired so long ago that it was truly really never about the principle. Um, but he sees this as a terrible injustice done to hardworking Chinese merchants. It was interesting that then the debtor's turn to protest this. The debtor was unwilling to trade the livestock he had access to directly for the debt, which was then the compromise um, that the Amban was proposing. And he insisted that he turn it into paper money before he pay any of the debt. This was perhaps an attempt to control the exchange rate, or perhaps an attempt to delay. His refusal to repay the debt in his livestock, despite having access to large herds, demonstrates that refusing to turn into live livestock into money could also prevent the information asymmetries that plagued Mongolians in their transactions. Um, it is also perhaps simply a method to avoid repayment that could have caused starvation. So we see that livestock presents a limit to the idea that all things in all situations could be considered money. Cases are very frequent in which Qing officials themselves prevent repayments of debt in livestock. Here we see the return of the long-standing Qing notion that Mongolian political stability rested in stored animals and the need to prevent these from turning into money and hence entering these systems of exchange over which they had little control. In one example, a large debt racked up in the Tetan Han Aimag from a Chinese firm totaled 200 silver tails and 3,000 bricks of tea. So it's a reasonably large debt, right? Not you know hundreds of thousands of tails. All the banner members had, however, was sheep, 
and the Yamen intervenes to prevent any of this payment in sheep for fears of starvation. In cases with other Russian lenders, Mongolian debtors put forward animals against their debts and then themselves would dictate the value of each animal to their Russian creditor. So you can imagine maybe not the, the most savvy Russian merchants getting taken by a very old sheep or you know, some kind of low quality animal that they couldn't tell the difference. So maintaining the animals were a form of money. Even as Mongolians had increased opportunities and often did work for currency, could provide a degree of limited liability in a region with few legal protections for Mongolian debtors. Um, so some concluding thoughts here. While acknowledging the limits of my source base, paper does not appear as a distinct and transformative agent in 19th century Mongolia. This is because I argue money, at least in Manchu, is operating as much as a category, signifying a set of obligations as it is as an object. And the most common monies themselves can be assimilated as a commodity, so paper sheets or salty cups of brick tea. People are drinking the tea that they're trading as well. But not all objects were equally good at fulfilling the role of money at all times. Sometimes the most desirable form of money was, well, money, paper money and copper coins. From both accounts of Russian merchants and the archive of the Yamen at Hure, paper currency became more valuable the poorer one was. But at other times, objects declared money could satisfy burdens with less onus. When Cherimpov, our unfortunate Buryat trader with his stolen goods with whom this paper opened, requested his payment in sheets of money, what did this mean? Perhaps as a Russian subject, the sheets of money were more valuable to him, as currency in Buryat territories was less complicated than on the Qing side of the border. We see that writing from the early 20th century, the Qing official, uh, Xu Shichang, wrote that it is, quote, Mongolian custom to exchange good for goods. Originally, there was no money. Interior merchants, meaning Chinese merchants, cast coins with almost no value. Another early 20th century account claimed that Mongolians had become accustomed to barter and therefore had not discovered the benefit of currency. It is almost as though these assessments had emerged from an economics textbook of the 20th century, nearly all of which recount a mythical pre-currency world in which barter eventually gives rise to money. But Xu Chang and these Chinese administrators were not alone in imagining that the complications of Mongolian money in the early 20th century were due to the introduction of currency. But we must return here to the world that debt created. Debt in Qing Mongolia relied on what um, one anthropologist has identified as quote, the theoretical divide in Western monetary theory between a uniformity imposed by states and the flexibility produced by markets. So fixing the value of goods would have made traveling Mongolian merchants and other Chinese merchants working in Mongolia uh, less able to obtain their spectacular profits and have gone against longstanding Qing ideas about conditions that facilitated stability in Qing Mongolia. So from the 1860s until the early 20th century, when alternative sources of credit became more widely, more widely available, paper currency is yet another object that has value when designated as money. It didn't simply provide a baseline against which other commodities could be measured. It intersected with a much longer history of monies, Mongolia and Eastern Siberia. Qing rule was, after all, predicated on non-uniformity or on the enforced production of difference in Mongolia and other non-Han regions including down to the money used. Here I'll turn to a quote by Jane Geyer from uh, over 10 years ago where her thinking on money in Atlantic Africa um, has informed some of this research. She writes, a transaction is a moment when correspondences are agreed upon. It emanates from valuational ranking and established potentials for traffic linkage, but it does not erase the asymmetries from which it originates and which motivated in the first place. These conditions are consonant with, even though not entirely reducible to, the centuries, long experience of Atlantic Africa with European mercantilism, with trade monies, built-in thresholds, revaluation of goods at those thresholds, and temporal uncertainty. So Manchu language money, I propose, was an abstracted category. Money was the obligation. It was the moment in which the debt became real. So to begin to conclude, I pose that money in 19th century Mongolia may fit accepted formal, edition, formal definitions of money almost perfectly. Thinking of money as a means of exchange, a store of value, and a unit as a count, the most economists' most common working definition, the term money in late 19th century Mongolia demonstrates these qualities. The supposedly economic, economically primitive Mongolians imagined by the Qing government, unable to compre comprehend the money and complexity of Chinese merchants or the market, actually developed a financial system that saw money for what it was at its very root, a designation of value that makes objects comparable at specific moments in time. 
to see money as a designated phase through which objects pass, what I try to refer to with this term hypermonetization, and this is an example of how careful we have to be in theorizing the larger functions of money, both modern and pre-modern, particularly in ascribing transformative powers to currency. Thank you. I to ask you about monasteries. Mm -hmm. um, monasteries, it seems, you know, you have anecdotes that include the estate of the Jetson Dalton, mm -hmm. the uh, Gandhian Monastery, and it seems that they have a very interesting, might have a very interesting role to play in this story mm -hmm. um, as places that certainly money pass through, mm -hmm. and some of the largest institutions of Mongolian society. Mm -hmm. um, but also uh, repositories of wealth mm -hmm. and value mm -hmm. <laughs> that were not necessarily associated with money. So I was wondering mm -hmm. from the documents that you looked at, what sort of role monasteries played and, and mm -hmm. if it changed over the time period? You yeah, at? this is a wonderful question. Monasteries are very important. They're institutions I wasn't sure I was going to look at, and then I ended up not being able to avoid them. So a very... Okay, a short answer is monasteries are also counterfeiting paper money because they have access to book printing technology, which is very interesting. So you see these monasteries getting in trouble for counterfeiting their money. Um, the more serious answer is that monasteries, uh, following the treaties in the 1860s, take over um, as intermediaries in the transport business. And they are using pre-existing networks both of um, like logistical networks of moving goods as well as access to their own repositories, these shang that they have, or tsong, um, to loan money to Russian merchants. So they're constantly at the edges of these cases and when you follow cases far enough, if people are able to acquire money from a Mongolian source, it's from a monastery. How this changes over time is a very good question. I think I would have had to spend time in monastic archives in ways that I didn't to really answer that. I saw, you know, quote unquote, lamas and monasteries throughout this period, and there didn't seem to be any kind of secular rise in the number of them. But they're definitely the most important nodes in taking over um, Russian Qing transportation after 1860 and in managing these relationships. Mm -hmm. right, of this yeah. period is, is the uh, extractive mm -hmm. nature of monasteries. Yes. And, well, yeah, so does it have any bearing on that narrative or? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I think monasteries often, monasteries do have debts to Chinese firms. And and these debts are very large and then they are distributed to their constituents, right? And this is part of that extractive narrative is that elites are taking on debts that poor people are forced to pay, essentially. Whether or not that's happening is very hard to say. Whether or not these debts are not for daily use products like medicine and fabric and things that are necessary um, is not as clear. That said, where's I going with this? Um, monasteries often have the clout to push back against these larger repayment cases by saying that you know, their herds are necessary to feed those who live in their jurisdictions and they are not going to give these up to debtors. This actually this case of Udoka at the end, he's not a lot, but he's attached to a monastery in some way. And it's the monastery's wealth that the creditor is going after here. Um, so it, I think I'm, I'm hesitating to to say how this works with the extractive narrative. I know that narrative. Um, except that the, the other side to their power in Mongolian society, and if you see them as extractive, is that they also then have the power to push back and to not give up their goods. Although they have stores of wealth on their own, right? They also have stores of ingots. They have stores of money, seemingly. But legally enforcing them to pay seems to be trickier than with average Mongolian constituents, average people out in banners. Marissa. Oh, how does money are seen as like productive in and of themselves? If there's sort of a, mm. um, I guess this would be how people talk about finance today in some, at least in some communities, mm -hmm. um, that, oh, I'm, 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 you know, 
making something out of the, the series of transactions, and that's like a genuine mm -hmm. productive activity. Um, and to, I guess, give you a sense of what I'm talking about from like a sort of contemporary ethnographic example. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking, I was reminded of someone I met this summer who is uh, living in a like, very, very remote area um, who is making, um, distilling liquor out mm -hmm. of goat, goat yogurt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, someone I was with who was like older, an older um, sort of not a lay person, he, he had been in the distillery business actually previously, so he, he mm -hmm. wanted me to interview this person. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of like friends because they were like the same age. Mm -hmm. So he, he basically told them in secret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was like, oh, he must be adding sugar to this. Mm -hmm. And it was a big, it was like a big secret. He was like, yeah, I, I sell my, you know, my homebrew to the local people, and mm -hmm. then I use the cash and I buy, um, or this cheaper, I buy Russian sugar. Mm -hmm. He specified it as Russian sugar, and this was like the big secret. And he wouldn't show, he wouldn't show us the inside of his still, even though he told us this big secret, right? So mm -hmm. there was, uh, I, I do see this as a sort of like I'm. I'm producing something here through these transactions, but there's some kind of secret going on. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, the basic question is like, are these transaction scenes productive in and of themselves? I think it's... Well, also yeah. probably subversive. <laughs> yeah, I think subversive is would be more what they're seen as, and it's hard to, to know how people felt about these transactions. This is something that is essentially entirely off limits to me. Um, you definitely see kinds of transactions that look like just theft and hustling. Like, for example, I had one case of someone, uh, people were cutting down telegraph poles because there was a wood shortage in the late 19th century, and these poles were pre-cut firewood that you could sell. Like, even the yamen is supposedly selling wood off of its walls to heat itself. Um, and they're also selling the cord the wrapped cord from the telegraph. And these people get caught because they go to Piakta, they try to sell it, and the person is actually a Qing official off duty, essentially, and turns them in. And you see the case when, the, the way you see these cases are usually the requiring to go back to their home regions so that they can take their corporal punishment there and have a higher chance of survival. Um, do people see that as a productive transaction? This is hard to say. Um, something that emerges from this is that the desperation of the 19th century is probably not an overdone narrative. People are existing on the verge of starvation. They are existing with very few resources, and this is in part why people are having to be so creative in what they're using. Um, is there a sense of pride in this? You know, definitely I've heard people speak about this, you know, in Alana Day today, right? There's a long history of doing these kinds of transactions at the time. I don't feel I could speak to that with any confidence. but. You definitely see people selling seemingly anything they can get their hands on. And this is not really, it's a kind of like neither legal nor illegal. Cutting down a telegraph pole is illegal because it's state property. But most of these transactions just fall into this unseen space where the Qing didn't write any legislation for this because you're technically not supposed to be doing it and you only tax Chinese firms when they enter Qing territory. So you essentially don't see what's going on and that's part of how the system can exist. I use system very loosely, part of how these practices can exist. Also, all about commodities, right? So, okay, well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The line becomes very, very blurred. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know, you think of it from your sources and materials. Mm -hmm. I think something um, I have been thinking about is the way that people are seeing paper money as IOUs for credit transactions, and I think this is pretty common, and that's part of why you don't see the currencies named, is because the paper money is just a new form of these older credit tickets that you'd had for several hundreds of years that established a debt relationship between you and the person who provided you goods. And so I think for some of these Mongolian purchasers, the 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 paper money of the ruble, the credit ticket, these other kinds of um, privately circulated paper monies that traveling Mongolian firms are putting around tend to merge into a similar thing. So I guess then the question is, you know, what is the relationship between money and credit in general? And I, not to just put this back on it, but I, I don't think I take such a hard line that all money is a form of debt. But this brings that view of money into into the spotlight. Right, that w what is money if not a relationship of owing something, either in the future or in the past? 
that you've you paid your debt or you're establishing it for the future. Mm -hmm. So it's what we're talking about here, where the state comes, so there's a rarely no. present. No. So what usually we do see people pay money is to get two percent or five percent percent. Yeah. So it becomes kind of very interesting when you talk about mostly some private actors mm -hmm. sort of negotiating these kind of like decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think in like the yep. contemporary modeling context also there's there's like a lot of practices of like of money where it's sort of like I'm the person who's controlling this <laughs> money right now, mm -hmm. you know, right? So there is a sense that the state again this is kind of subversive, right? Because people do respect the state, right? But but it's also like I'm in control of this money and I'm mm -hmm. doing things with it, right? Well I think it's it was actually surprising to me in um these are a lot of early 20th century debt recall cases in which people are calculating the debt in terms of Russian sheets of paper money, so rubles, that this is happening outside of Russian territory, so that this fiat currency has any value outside of where the state can enforce that value is in itself very interesting. The czar, the czar is not going like, to no. you up in your case. No, <laughs> but they're absolutely, and seemingly, these are not huge debt cases. These are cases where Mongolians will borrow you know, a small amount from a Russian merchant and pay it back. They pay it back in rubles. And this is probably in part why we do see Buryats and other trading parties importing rubles and not bringing in rubles to purchase but importing them as a commodity. The enforcement mechanisms of this are always hard to figure out and I think that's some of the missing piece of this. Um, I'm, I was very interested in the way you, you brought uh, the agency back to people in Mongolia mm -hmm. in this long descriptions, you know, for, I mean, I got my, um, I'm thinking of my sources, um, looking at uh, socialist Russian mm -hmm. sources that they think the Mongols as very passive, mm -hmm. economically and commercially mm -hmm. naive, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, and also the, the, the idea of exploitation, as if they really have no say in it. And yep. So I'm interested in, in what you have to say about the, the notion of trust mm -hmm. between the, the Mongolians and the local Chinese, well, mm -hmm. the Chinese traders. Mm -hmm. um, because it seems that in order to have some kind of commercial um, and economic relationship, there must be some sense mm -hmm. of trust between yep. the two. Um, the, the arrival later of, the, of Russian traders doesn't seem to have relieved um, the mm -hmm. Mongols of any pressure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From this format I read, it looks like mm -hmm. the, the, the Mongols actually continue to deal with the Chinese rather than mm -hmm. to the Russians. So I'm interested mm -hmm. in this idea of, I mean, I mean mm -hmm. you know much more mm -hmm. than, than I do about this, but I do not know. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful question. I think trust is very important. I'll give a caveat of um, some of these would have been in a kind of level more local than the documents I was looking at. But the way that these firms work in a general sense is that these you know, accountants back in their home bases in Shanxi are becoming quite wealthy from these interest payments. This is essentially a source of revenue without needing to put much more capital back into it. But they are not the ones ever going to Mongolia to work. And we know that by the 19th century they're sending out these clerks. Um, Mongolia was considered a hardship position in these firms because they also work in southern China in the southern parts of the Qing, they would train these uh, clerks to learn Mongolian and they would send them out to Mongolian regions and they would live there for up 15, 20 years. They would marry Mongolian women. They would have Mongolian children. Um, and there is obviously some degree of trust with these people. And even though they are all technically part of the same, you know, Shanxi bank, they're actually operating, these uh, Mongolian, these Chinese merchants living in Mongolia are operating as subsidiaries. So when you see in the documentation what firm they come from. They never come from Da Shengkui or some large Chinese bank. They come from some bank you've never heard of because they are a many level down subsidiary of this major Chinese bank. And their life is there. There's obviously a degree of trust. There's obviously a sense that you know, they're not going to inf enforce a repayment regime that absolutely impoverishes this region where the people are going to have a way to push back against it. And there's all these times, you know, what I'm seeing in cases is that that ruptures. There are times where people can't pay back their debts. But why that case came to that level of maybe mistrust, I don't know. Because obviously these people are having relationships for decades.
maybe it was viewed as a, it was worth it to obtain medicine, to obtain clothing, to obtain all of these commodities that they were otherwise relatively barred from trade networks. Does that answer? Hmm. The idea of exploitation, I think, mm -hmm. seems, I, mean, I, I think that the Chinese who are trading in Mongolia probably also have to navigate very carefully um, how much you could land because they might yeah. not be able to reach, you know, to get their money back. Yes. So I think the idea of, you know, I mean, of course, it's a very socialist uh, notion of exploitation, but mm -hmm. it, it kind of maybe you run both ways. I wonder whether you, you get a sense of that as well, but maybe some Mongols knew how to use the system. And not be back, or? I saw that, absolutely. I saw that more with Russian merchants who were newly entering a region they obviously did not know much about. And there are many cases um, from both Russian and Qing archives of people not being repaid at all. There are some Chinese cases where Mongols would disappear into the pasture lands. This is the phrase, and they could not get their, their money back. And there are Chinese who are, we spoke about this earlier, who are wandering into Mongolia seemingly with no bank, with no one behind them. They have a couple of pelts, and they don't get anything back. You know, uh, absolutely. I think debt non-repayment is a, a form of agency, but I see it more with um, with Russian merchants who are not aware of the complex environment in which they're working. So I would, I would uh, suggest there was this sense of trust that was established yes. the between the Chinese and Mongols. Yes. No. I think I think that one could absolutely make that argument in specific cases. I, I was also thinking about. Um, that reminded me too of, I was thinking about like some of the sort of um, ethnography in the last like 10 years or so, I guess, about pawn shops or like La yep. mm -hmm. And um, uh, basically my sense of that is kind of like, um, again, again, these anthropologists are pointing out like that there, there does at least seem to be some sort of level of formality or like, and they don't, the pawn shops don't seem to be making like huge amounts of profit like by extracting from people. So there is some kind of like, the, the pawn shops I guess are also in debt to other people and people have these ongoing sets of relations mm -hmm. and like what what is sort of kind of makes people feel weird about like turning their stuff over and like buying people's used stuff is more, I don't know where this has been. Mm -hmm. So kind of that, that having like, it, the important thing is to know who you're transacting with maybe, right? And like we're always in these like larger networks of, of debt. It's not like a one-off relationship. Mm -hmm. So you do want to, the, the important thing is like something like transparency, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is about um, the first image that you show, I think the second one, um, this, yeah, um, this one? Yeah. Uh, what, what is your source of this image? These are Keenan's photos from his travels through Siberia in the 18, late 1880s, 1890s. Yeah, I, I also use it myself, but in my database hmm. it says my machen. So yeah. So oh, my yeah, this is my machen, technically. Oh, sorry, did I say this was Kyakta? Yeah. Oh, sorry, that I misspoke on that. This is okay. labeled as my machen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think in my document, they're so often um, referred to as a singular place, uh -huh, uh -huh. even though it, in many yeah. ways they're not. That yeah, that was a misstep. Thank you for okay. clarifying that. Um, uh, and the other one is uh, the using the bricks of tea as a mm -hmm. uh, uh, payment method. Mm -hmm. of payment. Mm -hmm. uh, was it also from the very beginning of the chain, starting from the very beginning from the currency period? Yes. Uh, okay. Even when Ihure was not Ihure, was it also? Uh, for the payment? How early does it mm -hmm. go? This is a good, this is a very good question. I, you do see bricks of tea. You do see tea being used as yeah. payment in the Kangxi period. Uh -huh. Whether or not they're standardized in the way that they are by the 19th century, that I'm not sure about. I've only seen the terms thin tea and fat tea in the 19th century. Uh -huh. And these have usually pretty distinct um, right. amounts of copper cash that they equate to. But tea is used as a kind of payment in the way that rhubarb is in the Kangxi period. I see. Um, and the last question, I'm sorry. Um, um, when the American trading company yes. begins its activities in Hue, yeah. how, what, what, can you say something about this? This is a wonderful question and something I have wanted to know more about myself. Um, it was very difficult to find 
information about American merchants, at least where I was looking in the archive in Hure, which was in the, the trade folios. Um, seemingly, there are many more Chinese merchants uh, going bankrupt in the late 19th century, and this is in part because of the American competition and import particularly of low-grade fabric, kind of low-grade uh, chengme is the other major import besides brick tea that people are using as a quasi-currency. Um, I see occasionally, you know, a French merchant would be going through Kyakta or an American merchant would be going through Kyakta, but it was hard to find sustained information about their activities in the archive, which surprised me as well. But I think they are putting pressure in the kind of low-grade commodity market um, along with, with Russian merchants. Mm -hmm. um, this is just an anecdote, but uh, yeah. along with talking about tea, I'm not mm -hmm. sure about the standardization question, mm -hmm. but it is also interesting that tea is used not just in payment to the government, mm -hmm. right, but also within the network mm -hmm. of monasteries as a form of, we could say, tribute. Mm -hmm and pilgrimage and mm -hmm. offering, right, within mm -hmm. um, tea embassies. Yeah, yeah, of course, right? of, course. Tea embassies of course. Sent, um, you know, from Amalia to Hossa. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so tea in that sense had a particular um, association with mm -hmm. this monastic economy, too. No doubt it originates from this. I went far enough back. It seemed quite terrible to me. It's actually interesting how that sort of more or less the same across I think the difference is that in Mongolia they have a lot more leeway in what they're calculating as worth 10%. You know, if they're in Fujian, they cannot be doing these kinds of manipulations with commodity monies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the questions.